welcome to uh, our most recent talk in our uh, cross-border uh, issues dialogue uh, legal series. Uh, I'm Alan Gibb from uh, uh, the School of Law, uh, uh, Faculty of Law, and uh, I'm chairing uh, today's uh, uh, meeting. Um, today's speaker is uh, Professor Yu Jia, um, who is the Henry Chain Professor in uh, International Law and Head of the Department of Law at HKU. And of particular relevance, he's also um, the, the head of the Hague Convention. Uh, I think they've been rebranded, not rebranded now, they're called the HCC, which is Regional uh, Office uh, in Hong Kong uh, for Asia and the Pacific uh, uh, region. And uh, today he intends to talk uh, uh, about the, the recent uh, work of the, the Hague uh, Convention um, with particular reference to uh, the, the recent uh, Hague uh, Judgments Convention. And uh, you know, even though the, the Hague Convention is all about um, developing and providing you know, a, a common uh, legal framework between states, uh, it's just worth emphasizing that uh, I think the work of the convention is particularly important in, in this region um, because uh, the work of the convention uh, is being used as a model for many of the recent um, uh, initiatives between uh, China and its other law districts uh, like uh, Hong Kong uh, to create inter-regional uh, private international law uh, roles. So for example, the, the Judgments Convention uh, has basically uh, been responsible um, for the creation of this uh, arrangement in uh, January 2019 uh, between uh, the mainland and Hong Kong um, for the, the mutual recognition and enforcement of civil and commercial judgments. And uh, this arrangement, when it becomes law, hopefully it will mean comparatively easy enforcement of, of recognition of judgments between Hong Kong and the mainland is very largely based on the Hague uh, Conventions uh, Judgments Convention, the Hague Conferences Judgments Convention. So without uh, more ado, I'll hand you over uh, to Professor Jog. And uh, if you want to uh, leave uh, any questions on the chat uh, function, uh, if we have time at the end, then I can put some of these uh, questions uh, to the speaker for his comments. Okay, so I'll now hand you over to Professor Jaw. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kip. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to this very important uh, seminar series. I know I think a lot of distinguished speakers have already touched upon various topics I think, in the last um, uh, seminars already. Uh, so I think it's a great honor for me to speak on the HCCH and the Judgment Convention today. I know that Professor Gibman and also Professor Dickitan both are experts in the field of a private international law. Uh, so I think uh, um, it's very good that I will be able to exchange views and also learn from uh, Professor Gibb and also Professor Zhang. So as Professor Gibb have mentioned that today I would like to talk about uh, the uh, HCCH, the Hague Conference on Private International Law, and also the 2019 Judgment Convention. Um, so basically, I will spend around 20 to 30 minutes to introduce the HCCH, its work portfolio, et cetera, and then spend most of the time on the 2019 Judgment Convention, which has been considered as one major achievement in the legislature history of the HCCH. So let me share the screen.
Okay, so first of all, we have always heard about HCCH, the abbreviation. But why we use the HCCH to represent Hague Conference on Private International Law? This intergovernmental organization has English name here and also the French name. So the French and the English are the um, languages for this uh, uh, organization. That's why we pick up the HC and the CH. I think the red colors here, you can find out, I think, the reasons why have we use the abbreviations of four words. Now, what is the HCCH? It is an intergovernmental organization with legislative function. I still remember, I took over the representative position from last year. Uh, some emails I received asking me whether the organization offers arbitration services or mediation services. So I have been um, answering them that we are not going to offer uh, uh, arbitration services, mediation services. It's kind of organization which provides the rules for um, cross-border legal issues. The HCCH has a long history. It started in 1893, so now more than 125 years already. Um, the major purpose of this organization is to make rules, make international rules of private international law. So from the article one of the statute, it says the HCCH works towards progressive unification of the rules of private international law. We know that internationally, we have a three very important organizations which deals with the harmonization and unification of uh, rules in the field of a civil and commercial law. HCCH is one of them. Um, the other two organizations are the ANSITRAL and also UNIDUA. The HCCH develops and adopts Hague conventions and protocols. So far, we have already adopted 39 conventions and one soft law instruments, which deals with the contract law issues. Um, among these 39 conventions, we will normally divide the conventions into three pillars. The first one is international civil procedure and legal cooperation. Second, international family law and child protection. And third, international commercial law and finance law, so which I will come back later on. The HCCH take a very uh, pragmatic approach. So it tries to come up with something which can be workable, which can be accepted widely among the member states. So it, it has practical outcomes with direct benefits. Now, HCCH mainly deals with four key questions, which you can see from the screen, four areas. The first one, jurisdiction. The second, applicable law. Third, recognition and enforcement. And lastly, cooperation. Jurisdiction issue means which court should have jurisdiction, has authority to make decisions on the disputes. That's the first step. The second issue, conflict of laws, applicable law. So we basically deal with the laws that are to be applied to disputes. And third areas on the Enforce recognition and enforcement. How can judgments or decisions be recognized or enforced abroad? And lastly, it's rather important. For a long time, we emphasize about the judicial cooperation. Now we realize, apart from judicial uh, uh, cooperation, we also need to look at the diminished cooperation, which appears to be more important. That means we are not only looking at the cooperation among the judges, among the courts, we are also looking at the cooperation among administrative entities in different countries. So you can see the cooperation basically deals with how can authorities better cooperate to improve efficiency and overcome the obstacles arising in cross-border situations. It is rather important to see that the HCCH does not deal with substantive law issues. Instead, it works to build bridges 
across legal system and respect the legal diversity. I've mentioned about three international organizations in the harmonization and utilization of private laws, civil and commercial laws. The ANSI trial, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, and UNIDOA, uh, uh, which also works on the unification of uh, private laws. These two organizations touch upon the substantive law issues. The HCCH is only intergovernmental organization dealing with the unification and harmonization of the conflict of law rules. It's rather important to see the working methods of the HCCH. It builds bridges on the consensus basis, which proved to be a result for success. We have quite a lot of discussions about the consensus building process, which is very time consuming, but we believe this is rather important. We are not going to exclude any countries and member states. We are trying to collaborate, cooperate with among each other. Uh, so from here, we can see the HECCH already has a global networks. We have members and state parties we have national experts and delegates and central and national authorities and professionals, acad academics and non-governmental organizations. And we also look into the diversity of legal traditions, which include civil law, common law, customary laws, the secular law system, etc. And we also accept the diversity of structures, including the unitary states, federal state, etc. For the history of more than 125 years, we always emphasize about the importance of mutual trust, support, and respect. I still remember in 2018, 2018 the 125th anniversary, uh, the HCCH held a major conference to celebrate the 125th years of history in Hong Kong. So we touched upon quite a lot of the issues to look at how to build consensus amongst member states. At the moment, HCCH has 88 members. So this year we have already two new members, Namibia, in January 2021, and then in Asia Pacific region, we have Thailand, uh, which have just submitted the acceptance of the statutes in March, on March 3rd, 2021. So these are the two newest members. We are expecting to expand the pool of members very soon. Uh, I understand another four, mem uh, four countries will become members probably within the next few months. In the Asia Pacific region, Mongolia will be the next candidate. Mongolia has already been admitted to HCCH in December last year. So we are waiting for the Mongolia, gov Mongolia government to submit the uh, instrument of acceptance of the statutes in due course. Uh, among the 88 HCCH members, we have 87 countries plus one intergovernmental organizations, that's the European Union. If we look at the development of the HECCH, as early stage, we always mention that HECCH is very Europe-centric. Most members are from the European country continent, but from 2000, we can find out many new members come from other continents. So since 2000, we have 41 new members, which account for 46% of the membership. Among these 41 members, we have 15 from Asia Pacific. So that's the members, uh, 88. But please note, we also have another concept of connected states, connected states. At the moment, we have altogether 154 states which are connected with HCCH. So that means apart from 88 
members, we also have uh, 67 non-HCCH members that is a contracting party or signatory to at least one Hague Convention or in the process of being, becoming a member. So in this sense, the Hague Conventions, the 39 Hague Conventions so far, are open to all the countries, not only to the HCCH members. HCCH uh, since 2000 has become very uh, universal, very international. So we have the headquarter in The Hague. Then in 2005, we set up the Latin America regional office. And then in 2012, we have the Hong Kong office, that's the Asia Pacific regional office in Hong Kong. Uh, so, uh, so we have the headquarters and then we have two uh, regional office. The headquarter, we normally call it permanent bureau, permanent bureau, the main office there. Uh, and I am the fourth representative for the Asia Pacific Region Office. Before that, uh, before me, we, uh, we have uh, uh, Justice Hartman, we have also uh, Justice uh, Reyes, and also Mr. Frank Korn. So I took over the office in June last year. One very important development of the Asia Pacific uh, Region Office is a new office. We moved into the new office in uh, last October to this building. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with this building or not. This is a building um, uh, which has been used by the Court of Final Appeal. Um, it's called the former French Mission Building. Fr uh, fr former French Mission Building has been used by the Court of Final Appeal. And since then, we, uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, able to work in this very uh, uh, heritage building. The regional office has a mission to act as a bridge to enhance communications and understanding between the permanent bureau of the HCCH in The Hague and the states in the Asia Pacific region. We have the task to promote Hague conventions and build networks within the region to facilitate good practice and a consistent implementation of the conventions. Since I took over as office, uh, I have been working hard with the member states in the Asia Pacific region to organize webinars to promote uh, various conventions, including the Service Convention, Evidence Convention, Judgment Convention, Choice of Court Convention, etc. The main activities for the HCCH includes two parts normative work and post convention work. Normative work, we refer to the legislative work. So first of all, we do research to identify the areas which needs legislation. Once this is done, we will come up with proposals for new instruments. We organize experts discussion and negotiations and diplomatic sessions, which can lead to the adoption of new instruments in the end. So in, the new instruments can include conventions, protocols, soft law, etc. So far, we have only one soft law document. All other documents are conventions or protocols. Now, after the adoption of the conventions, protocols, and soft law documents, we will come to the post-convention work. It includes the promotion of the organization and the documents, instruments. We also monitor the operation of the instruments, provide the opportunities to review the operation of the conventions. So we have the special commissions on practical operations of the instruments uh, carry out the review regularly. We also publish guide to good practice handbooks to the conventions, and also explanatory reports for the better operation of the conventions. And lastly, we also have the post-convention assistance to the member states, uh, which can help the member states to implement and operate the conventions. Now, as I mentioned, 
there are three pillars of the documents made by HCCH. The first pillar is the protection of children, international matrimonial and family relations. Um, we have the convention like Child Abduction Convention, Inter-Country Adoption Convention, Child Protection Convention, Protection of Adults Convention, Maintenance Convention, etc. The second pillar deals with the judicial and uh, the administrative cooperation litigation, which includes the forms of wills, a positive convention, which is very successful. We have more than 118 members already a positive convention, a service convention, evidence convention, evidence convention so far we, uh, has uh, uh, around 70 member states, 69 member states. And uh, it entered into force in the 1980s. So the, uh, the 1980, so last year was the 40th anniversary of the entry into force of the evidence convention. And we also have the access to justice convention and 2005 cho choice of court convention. I didn't put down the 2019 judgment convention, which of course belongs to this second pillar. And the third pillar deals with the commercial and the financial laws, uh, which include the trust convention, security convention, and choice of law principles, which is a soft law document. The Hague Conventions can bring the benefits to the member states. The first is to facilitate international trade, commerce, and foreign direct investment. So for example, the Apostle uh, uh, Convention, Service Convention, Evidence Convention, etc., cetera, um, can help to provide legal certainty and predictability and establish uniform global standards leading to a climate more conducive to cross-border trade and investment. The second is regarding human rights. Uh, this, of course, touches upon the first pillar. Uh, for example, the child abduction, protection, adoption conventions give effect to the fundamental principles uh, in the uh, human rights conventions, the UN conventions, on the protection of the rights of the child or protection of the adults uh, or uh, the persons with disabilities. It takes years to come up with a new convention. Normally, it takes five stages to come to adopt a new convention. Suggestions, analysis, recommendation, preparation, new document, uh, new convention, and adoption. Uh, suggestions can be made by members, international organizations, or the secretariat. After the suggestion was made, the secretariat will start the analysis to look into the needs of a uh, document. After the analysis, then the secretariat will make recommendation to the Council on General Affairs and Policy, which holds a meeting once a year, normally in early March. The Council on General Affairs and Policy will adopt will consider whether the recommendations uh, of a possible conventions and future work should be uh, accepted. Once this is accepted or adopted, then special commission will be set up to prepare new conventions. It takes several conferences or meetings um, for the new convention, the draft convention to move for adoption in the diplomatic sessions. So I use one example to elaborate on the negotiation and adoption of a new convention. Uh, this, I use the example of a 2007 child support convention. Uh, the secretariat first started research and then the questionnaire was sent to the states and interest organizations in 1998 and 2002. The member states can start the consultation informal discussions which leads to a background report in 2003. Afterwards, negotiation will be uh, launched. So for the 2007 Child Support Convention, the negotiation sessions uh, were conducted once a year from 2003 to 2007. In the meantime, meetings were also held between the sessions 
by drafting committee, applicable law working group, uh, the administrative cooperation working group, and form some committee. And finally, in November 2007, diplomatic conference, the member states agreed to adopt the convention. The whole process was to be led by the secretariat, but controlled by the states. So the, all the member states should have a say in the whole process. As I have just mentioned, the HCCH has a permanent bureau, the head office in Hague. It uh, is a relatively small entity, fewer than 30 member staff. And the, with a budget of uh, uh, around 4.1 million euros per year. Uh, within the permanent bureau, smaller meetings like the experts and the working groups meeting or standing committee meeting, up to 40 participants can be held in that building. But when it comes to the major conferences, in, such as the special commissions uh, meeting, council on general affairs, council of diplomatic representatives, uh, diplomatic sessions, etc., uh, uh, will he uh, be held in the Hague Academy building. So, uh, for all these con uh, meetings, conferences, we adopt the consensus building process. So I think that's a very uh, brief introduction to the HCCH. Now we know that the newest or latest developments of the HCCH is the 2019 convention, which was adopted in, uh, on July the 2nd, 2019 on the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments in civil or commercial matters. It has a long history. We are very pleased to see that the conventions was able to be adopted after years of discussion, years of negotiation. If we look at the situation before 2019, recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments were governed by national law or bilateral agreements such as Chen's Tasman agreements, the New Zealand, Australia. And also, as Professor Gibb had mentioned, the arrangements between mainland China and Hong Kong SAR. And also international and supranational agreements. So that's the situation before 2019. And the 2019 convention can fill in the gap at the international level. So, so from the picture, we can see the international framework on the recognition and enforcement is needed. Although the HCCH has one convention in 1971 regarding the enforcement of foreign judgments, but this document was not very successful. So far, we have only five members, so it was not very widely accepted. Apart from this convention, we have also the 2005 Choice of Court Convention, which touches a small areas of the issues of judgment recognition. So the 2019 convention is more comprehensive to deal with the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments. Let me very briefly mention about the history of the judgment project. The discussions started in 1990s, or more uh, specifically, 1992. There were proposals on the development of a comprehensive instrument on jurisdiction and recognition and enforcement. But the negotiation discussion proves to be very difficult. The member states failed to reach consensus regarding the contents, the substance of such a very ambitious project. So in 2001, the project was suspended and they decided to start step by step. So the first step is to consider the choice of court convention, which deals with exclusive choice of court. And this uh, convention was adopted in 2005. 
after the adoption of the 2005 convention, the expert group started to think about the second step. So in 2011, expert group begins assessing the poss possible merits of continuing the judgment project. Two, uh, 2013 to 15, the working group meets to prepare a draft text for deliberation as a special commission. Since then, four special commission meetings were held to negotiate the draft convention during 2016 to 18. And finally, in the diplomatic uh, conference uh, in, uh, Ju on, in June 2019, the HCCH members and observers came together for final round of negotiation with the adoption of the, con uh, the convention on 2nd of July 2019. Uh, at the moment, uh, the convention has not taken uh, entered into force, has not entered into force. Uh, three countries have already uh, submitted the, uh, the instruments of acceptance. The uh, first one is Uruguay, the second one is Ukraine, and the third one is Israel. Israel submitted the, the instrument in March 2021. The Judgment Convention aims to enhance access to justice for all and to promote international trade and investment and mobility. With the Convention, we try to ensure meaningful judgments so judgments can, foreign judgments can be recognized and enforced and can help to reduce duplicate proceedings and reduce costs, timeframes, and allowing informed choices. The Judgment Convention sets up a common framework for recognition and enforcement at international level. It provides a set of commonly accepted rules or minimum standards for recognition and enforcement of judgments across jurisdictions, and it is complementary instrument to the 2005 Choice Court Convention. We always mention that the 2005 Convention and the 2019 Judgment Convention are a package. When we promote the conventions on the recognition and enforcement of the foreign judgments, we put these two conventions together. The choice of the court convention, as I mentioned, it only touches upon a smaller areas regarding the exclusive choice or they have, if the, uh, there's agreements regarding the exclusive choice for court, then we will uh, try to apply the 2005. If there's no such agreement, then we will look at the 2019 Judgment Convention. The general features. The convention deals only with recognition and enforcement of foreign judgments between contracting states. It's important to see that the convention does not allow the review of the merits. It provides an exhaustive list of commonly accepted grounds of indirect jurisdiction, which can be used to assess the eligibility of the judgment, which I will come back very soon regarding the eligibility. It also provides an exhaustive and non-mandatory list of uh, uh, grounds for re uh, refusal. It's rather important to see that the convention does not prevent recognition and enforcement under national law, except one area, which were defined in Article 6 regarding the irremovable um, property. So in that sense, the convention sets a floor, not a ceiling. So that uh, sets a minimum standards or minimum requirement for recognition and enforcement. Now, let's look at the operation of the convention. To determine whether a judgment can circulate under the convention, three questions need to be answered. The first question is regarding the scope whether the judgment is within the scope. Second, after, 
uh, after the, um, uh, the confirming the first qu uh, question, then we move to the second question regarding the eligibility. And finally, the third regarding whether there's any situations or circumstances to refuse the recognition and enforcement. Let me explain step by step. Scope. For scope, I will look at four aspects, material scope, temporal scope, geographical scope, and also the understanding of judgment. Material scope. It's quite clear that the convention only applies to civil or commercial matters. It excludes revenue, customs, or administrative matters. So only civil or commercial matters. But among the civil or commercial matters, several items were excluded. The reasons for the exclusion, which were put out in Article 2, mainly are to avoid overlap with other conventions, in particular the HCCH conventions. So, uh, for example, the issues regarding the status of and family law matters, uh, maintenance obligations, matrimonial property regimes, wills and succession, the carriage of passengers and goods, liability for nuclear damage, insolvency, arbitration and related proceedings, all these have been covered in other conventions. Like the carriage of passengers, we of course have the formerly the Warsaw Convention, we have the Montreal Convention, uh, nuclear damages, definitely we have a lot of uh, international conventions regarding the nuclear damage. And arbitration, of course, we have the uh, New York Convention. Mediation, we have already had the Singapore Mediation Convention. That's the first reason. The second reason is to respond to different sovereign economic and cultural diversities. Many countries have different views regarding the issues like defamation, privacy, IP, certain antitrust um, uh, competition issues, activities of armed force, law enforcement activities, sovereign debt, uh, restructuring through unilateral state measures, etc. So these are the two major reasons why we exclude the, these few items from the scope of civil or commercial matters. When it comes to the preliminary questions, it is quite clear that the judgment is not excluded where an excluded matter arose merely as a preliminary question and not as an object of the proceeding. So for example, in a contractual dispute, uh, we probably will have to, or the judge probably will have to deal with the personal capacity, whether an individual has a capacity to sign a contract or not. This belongs to its preliminary question. And if the judgment is made, the decision was made, on these preliminary questions, this will not affect the recognition and enforcement issue because this is not the object of the proceedings. Furthermore, the member states can also make declarations. That's declaration regarding internationality. That means the member states can declare that the convention does not apply to pure domestic cases. This can be used to prevent the forum shopping. So the, the whole case scenarios has only relationship with one country. The only foreign element was the court of a region. So in that situation, the country member states can declare uh, pure domestic cases will not be uh, included in the convention. Uh, in the application. Second, subject matter declaration. The member states can also declare the convention will not apply to certain subject matters in which the state has a strong interest. Article 18 also made it very clear. If you make the declaration, you have to make it very specific. 
we try to narrow down the areas for uh, the exclusion. And third, some member states can also make declarations regarding the non-application to judgment, which arose from proceedings to which such a state was a party. So these are the possibility for declaration for the member states to declare non-application of the convention. When it comes to the matters related to states, the convention put down in Article 2, Paragraph 4, that the judgment is not excluded by the mere fact that a state or an entity acting on behalf of state is a party to the proceedings. But even the convention might apply to this type of judgment. The convention further clarify that it will not affect any privileges or immunities enjoyed by states or international organizations. This is to be combined with the uh, matters that have been excluded in earlier provisions, such as uh, activities of armed force, law enforcement activities, sovereign debt restructuring through unilateral state measures, etc. So through this way, we can find out that the convention provides some flexibility. That means the member states, when acceding to the convention, can make declaration. And this also can be considered some uh, innovations in the designing or in the negotiation of the convention. Now we move to the temporal scope. Uh, this is quite straightforward. It only applies to the uh, judgments. That as the time the proceeding were instituted in the time in the state of origin, uh, the convention had effects between the state and and the requested state, so which has been put on. So that's a temporal uh, scope. And then the geographical scope, um, the convention only applies uh, to the contracting states. So the convention shall have effect between the state of origin and the requested state. Furthermore, it's quite useful to mention that the convention only apply to the two countries which have not objected to the treaty relation regarding the other. So that means the countries, the member states, when acceding to the convention can declare or to make, uh, uh, to, uh, make some reservations that the convention will not apply to a specific country. So that's possible. So uh, the, that's of some very important mechanism to include um, as many members as possible. And this is considered a kind of a bilateralism. Um, so that means when you acceding to the conventions, both the contracting state as a new state can object to the application of the convention to a specific country, specific member. And this kind of uh, um, declaration objection can be withdrawn at any time. Now we come to the fourth issue, the judgments uh, in the first uh, step regarding the uh, scope, judgments. The convention in its title have mentioned about the foreign judgments. So first of all, the judgments should be given by a court in a contracting state. It does not matter this court is a commercial court, a criminal court, or IP court. We look, only look at the nature of the disputes. So the judgment made by a court. The judgment should touch upon the merits. 
including monetary, non-monetary, uh, et cetera. So all, all the issue. And that's no application to uh, interim measures. The judgment should have effect or is enforceable in a state of a region. So it's rather interesting to see the term, ter terminology about enforceability. We use the term of enforceability instead of finality. And finality requirement has always been a very uh, controversial issue. So that's why um, um, the convention has been very practical in using the enforceability, uh, this term. Um, and finally, uh, it also applied to the judicial settlement, which has been approved by a court or concluded in a course of court proceedings and are enforceable in the same manner as a judgment in a state of a, reg uh, of a region. From what we have seen from the material scope, temporal scope, uh, geographical scope and judgment, we can see that the 2019 Judgment Convention has a modest scope. Some might say it's too narrow. Some might say it's very broad already. So in a way, I think it's quite modest in view of the sheer number of member states. They hold different views, different countries have different uh, rules regarding the recognition and enforcement. So uh, we should be happy to see the conclusion um, in this way. It's modest, of course, there will be areas for further improvements or expansion. And it contains sufficient flexibility and introduces certain novelties. Once it falls within the scope, we move to the second step regarding the eligibility. The uh, eligibility. The eligibility issue, we only look at the indirect jurisdictional basis. During the negotiation, there have been some views that the convention should include the jurisdiction and also recognition and enforcement. But the jurisdiction issue proves to be quite controversial. So it avoids direct jurisdiction, which has been put uh, delayed for a further negotiation. The convention itself adopts indirect jurisdictional basis. Uh, two major articles provide the indirect jurisdiction issue. Article 5 provides 13 alternative jurisdictional filters. Only, one, only when the judgment is uh, uh, linked to one of the uh, of 13 filters will this judgment be in, uh, recognized and enforced. Article 6 mainly deals with exclusive basis, deals with the uh, irremovable uh, property. So Article 5, uh, paragraph 1, in this uh, paragraph, the 13 filters mainly uh, deals with three aspects. The first category is regarding the connection with the defend uh, de uh, defendants. We use the term of habitual residence of the defendant. The second category regarding the consent, express consent and implied consent of the party. And third category deals with the connections between the claims and the state of region. So that means as long as the judgment can satisfy one of the filter, then it can be put forward for circulation, for recognition and enforcement. The third category touches upon branch agency issue, uh, contractual disputes, torts, trust, count, counterclaim, uh, lease of immovable uh, uh, property, etc. Now we look at specific uh, situation. I think I just use uh, some scenarios as example to elaborate. Um, when we touch upon a branch agency or other establishment without separate legal personality, uh, 
Here, we do not touch upon legal persons. We touch upon the entities without legal personality. The filters put down here, it was maintained that the branch agency or us establishment was maintained in the state of origin at the time that person became a party to the proceeding in court of origin and the claim on which the judgment is based arose out of the activities of that branch agency or establishment. Now, in this case, uh, the filter, it's rather important that the judgment touch upon the activities of the branch agency or establishment not the general activities and not to the, uh, the, the uh, major company or the controlling company, the activities of a controlling company. We only specifically refer to this branch agency or establishment. For the contractual obligation, it should be given by a court of the state in which performance of that obligation took place or should have taken place unless the activities of the defendant in relation to the transaction clearly did not constitute a purposeful and substantial connection to that state. So several conditions were put down for this filter. We only look at the performance of the obligation, the major obligation, the performance of the major obligation. Furthermore, we will look at whether that's purposeful and substantial connection. This is trying to prevent forum shopping again. A lease of immovable property, then the filter is the location of the property, regarding the location of the property. A non-contractual obligation arising from death, physical injury, damage to, or loss of tangible property, um, we will use a filter of uh, the location of the occurrence of the harm, sorry, uh, the location of the act of omission, which caused the harm. So we only use look, uh, this filter. Some scholar also mentioned why we do not look into the location of the harm. Uh, this can be very controversial. During the negotiation, some pe people, say, uh, some scholars, some experts have mentioned, and uh, no one really knows clearly the location of uh, um, invisible harm or psychological harm. So it's better uh, we narrow down to the location of the act which causes the harm. So that's the purpose lying behind. And then the validity, construction, effects of the miniature change or variation of the trust. This again, we use the filters regarding um, the state of a region which was designated in the trust instrument or expressly or implied designated as a, 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 the place where the principal place of the administration of the trust is situated. So that's the filter. Article five, when we look at the eligibility, the second paragraph deals with the judgments against consumers and employees. Consumers and employees are considered to be weak party. That's why we need to have special protection to these two categories of uh, parties. Uh, so that means Article 5, Paragraph 1, the filters, we need to uh, limit or restrict some of the filters. So for example, uh, when it comes to the express consent or implied consent to the jurisdiction of the court, then this will not be applied because we would like to uh, make sure that consumer voluntarily agrees to the jurisdiction of the court. You have to clearly, expressly mention in a court proceeding that you agree to this jurisdiction instead of prior agreement or implied agreement. Article 5, paragraph 3, touch upon the 
immovable property, uh, the residential lease of immovable property. Uh, so again, we look at the place of the immovable property. Now, Article 6 provides an exclusive jurisdictional basis for judgments lewd on the right in realm of immovable property. If and only if the immovable property is located in a state of origin. So this is exclusive jurisdiction. Article 5 will not be applied when it comes to the right in realm of immovable property. Furthermore, the national law or international treaties will also have to respect Article 6. That means judgments regarding the rise in realm of immovable property, we will only look at whether the judgment was made in the court with the uh, in the location of the immovable property. Even if the national law or international treaties uh, provides art, uh, differently, it, uh, it will not um, defeat the Article 6. Article 6 will continue to apply. Now, uh, after the second step for the eligibility, now we move to the third step, the grounds for refusal. Whether there are any grounds to for uh, refusal. The convention provides clear rules regarding the possibilities to refuse the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgment. Article 7 provides several very important grounds. These few grounds, I must say, not something new. For example, defective service or the notification. This has something to, something to do with the due process. So it's a rather important, uh, or sometimes we say it's a uh, something to do with a natural uh, justice fraud. Public policy and procedural fairness issue. Public policy uh, has always been a very interesting issue that has been covered not only in arbitration, but also in other areas. Um, of course, uh, we admit that it's rather difficult to define uh, what is public policy. There are discussions that uh, uh, at the international level, the public policy should be used uh, in uh, very narrow areas and we have to use it restrictively. Uh, some scholars or practitioners argue that public policy, uh, we only refer to international public policy, uh, etc. So there are some discussions. Uh, but I'm, um, uh, I, I would say that the public policy, um, I, I think has uh, the trend is that this will be used very restrictively. Uh, if we look at the trend uh, for the recognition and, uh, and enforcement of the foreign arbitral award, I think we, the member states, the countries have always been very cautious in using the public policy exception. And the, um, the Article 7 also mentioned about the possibility to refuse the recognition and enforcement of judgment, uh, which uh, are in contradiction with the designate court in agreement or trust document. So we respect the, the, the choice of the, mem uh, the parties. Um, Article 7 also talk about pending proceedings. Um, so we do not uh, encourage or do not recognize the parallel um, proceedings. Uh, so in particular, you know, the uh, proceedings uh, with the same parties on the same subjects before the court of requested states. So that's possibility to refuse the recognition and enforcement. Article 10, touch upon the punitive damages. Uh, some countries, only recognize the damages for actual loss, not the punitive damages. So this leaves to the member states to decide whether they will recognize and enforce the judgments involving punitive damage. 
the court can decide to only recognize the part of damage which um, uh, is equivalent to the actual loss, not the actual part of damage. And art, uh, the next issue regarding the preliminary question, which I have uh, already mentioned, that a preliminary question will not be recognized uh, and enforced uh, uh, um, uh, under the convention. Now, with uh, the three-step analysis, uh, the scope, the eligibility, and the grounds for refu uh, refusal, I think after these three steps, I think we have clear ideas uh, regarding uh, the operation of the convention. I think that's from the substantive aspects to look at. Procedurally, um, is quite simple or quite, quite straightforward. When a contracting state requests the for a judgment to be recognized and enforced in a foreign country, um, that uh, normally we will apply the law of the requested states, requested state. The convention um, uh, includes four parts. So we ha I had very briefly mentioned about the operation and procedural issues. These are covered in the chapter two, chapter two. But the convention also touches upon several other very uh, important issues regarding the operation of the convention. Uh, Article 23 regarding the relationship with other international instruments. The guiding principle is that the convention should be interpreted so far as possible to be compatible with other treaties in force for contracting states, whether concluded before or after this convention. Furthermore, it specifically mentioned about the generous application to both international and regional economic integration organizations instruments concluded both earlier or later. So it's for quite generous and the convention will not affect the operation of other international instruments. The convention also needs to be interpreted cautiously. So that's why we can find out this year, the Permanent Bureau also released the explanatory report regarding the understanding of the text of the convention. We should advocate or promote a uniform interpretation of the convention in light of the international character of the convention and the aim to promote uniformity in its application. But when it comes to the uniform interpretation, we admit there are quite a lot of uh, uh, challenges. I summarize uh, the challenge into three categories. The first one is so regarding the understanding of the concepts. So for example, civil and commercial matters, privacy, how do we define? How do we understand? Of course, we know it's rather difficult to define. We will need to look into um, the practical situation. But this is not a uh, situation uh, very unique to the 2019 convention. That's one. Second. Also, how to apply the such con uh, concepts, how to apply. So for example, public policy, and then the constructive ambiguity in the application yeah, of uh, uh, certain provisions regarding non-contractual obligations, non-physical injuries, physical injuries, that no such definitions. And we will need to look at the case scenarios and of course, look at the documents so um, we can make reference to the objectives of the convention and its international character. The explanatory report and also preparatory documents. Furthermore, the court can also take into account the decisions 
or interpretations of other HCCH conventions or foreign decisions and commentary. So we leave to the court of a contracting state to decide, to interpret, although we would expect this interpretation is to be uniform. In the process of the uniform interpretation of the convention, the HCCH, the Permanent Bureau, and the Secretariat has some role to play. First, it can hold regular special commission meetings to evaluate its performance. It will also monitor the operation through collection of cases, holding events, publishing handbook, etc. But the HCCH and the Secretary will not be involved in specific cases. So to sum up, the convention provides a flexibility so that many countries, member states can consider to join. So as many countries as possible, we would like to have um, uh, uh, this convention uh, uh, in operation as soon as possible. And we do not expect the convention to take too long to uh, enter into force. Some conventions takes um, 10 years or 12 years or 15 years, but we expect the convention will uh, be relatively easier to be accepted. Uh, the conventions has a lot of uh, benefits, has a lot of uh, uh, advantages. So here's a legal certainty is one. The convention provides legal certainty for recognition and enforcement with sufficient flexibility to address the concerns of the state through the following mechanisms, such as the public policy grounds for refusal, and also the declaration mechanism, which I've mentioned is possible to declare the exclusion of purely domestic disputes to insist on the internationality, and then to declare to exclude certain subject matters, which I just mentioned, uh, which the state has a strong interest. And the members can also uh, declare to exclude judgment pertaining to a state or exclude treaty relations with other contracting states. So that's a flexibility which has been uh, put in the convention, in designing the convention. The benefits, obviously, it can provide the forcibility and legal certainty, which can bring benefits to the citizens, enterprises, and the society as a whole. At the moment, we look at the major dispute resolution mechanism. We, um, apart from negotiation, we have a mediation, arbitration, and litigation. In the field of arbitration, the New York Convention has been rather successful. If I remember correctly, we have already 168 members to the 1958 New York Convention already. And the New York Convention indeed helped to promote the arbitration. And the same, the Singapore Mediation Convention. We have uh, uh, members there, and one of the purpose is to promote mediation. Now, with the Hague Judgment Convention, we would also like to present to the members, to the users, that litigation can be also um, a viable option as compared to other dispute resolution mechanisms. So that means now we have three pillars in a field of recognition and enforcement, and we can put arbitration, mediation, and litigation on a par. Also, it's rather important to see the protection of interest for small and media-sized enterprises. I remember that APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Corporation, the APEC has done some research regarding the difficulties for the MSMEs, the micro, medium, small enterprises, MSMEs. They emphasize about the importance for uh, dispute resolution. They also identify 
dispute resolution, cross-border dispute resolution proves to be a major barrier for that business. So with all these uh, conventions in place, it provides the MSMEs uh, with some ways, some channels. Of course, uh, apart from the 1958 New York Convention, Singapore Convention, and the Hague Convention. Actually, we are also looking to the ODR, Online Dispute Resolution Mechanism, um, which uh, has been developing rapidly in the last few years. The APAC is looking to, the Hague uh, HCCH is also looking to the possible application of ODR to resolve certain type of disputes. The ANSI trial, the same. The ANSI trial has already adopted the documents regarding uh, uh, the ODR, the technical notes on online dispute resolution in 2016. And further negotiations still going on regarding how to, uh, the issues of uh, uh, regulation of the ODR platform. How do we come up with a regime regulatory regime for ODR platforms, et cetera. So all these are ongoing. Uh, so the, when the ODR framework is in place, we can see the MSMEs will be re rather, rather happy to see uh, the mechanism in place. Uh, we notice that uh, MSMEs in the APEC economies um, actually play a rather important role. Uh, if we look at the numbers, the percentage among all the enterprises, MSMEs, took up more than 95% of all enterprises. So that means MSMEs should be in the, a major role for, for, our, uh, for us to consider how to benefit MSMEs. So the Hague, uh, Hague Convention is one um, step to help the MSMEs. So, uh, and of course, the attract, attract a foreign investment business and being inspiring resources for national recognition and enforcement rule reform and modernization, uh, which can also contribute to the harmonization of the laws in the region. So I think this uh, is something which um, I think Professor Gibb uh, had mentioned in the very beginning that actually the uh, Hague Convention also has impact on other members uh, in the uh, Asia Pacific region, uh, like the um, mainland China and Hong Kong agreements, uh, arrangements, etc. So which uh, plays a quite important role. Now, uh, finally, we come to the joining the convention. Um, the Secretary General of the HCCH and also other members of the HCCH has been quite optimistic regarding the 2019 uh, convention um, because we have put in several mechanisms uh, which uh, appears to be welcomed by the member states. First of all, the Judgment Convention is an open convention. That means you uh, if, uh, even if you do not um, uh, negotiate uh, uh, in the um, uh, adoption process, uh, you were not part of the negotiation process. If you, uh, even if you do not um, involve, uh, was not involved in the work of the judgment convention preparation, even if you are not the members to the HCCH, you can always consider to become a member to the judgment convention. So it is open to the states that were not presented at the diplomatic session. It do, does not require setting up a central authority. If you have the court, that will be good enough. So only judiciary. And the permanent bureau published a re recommended form to help the enforcement the, um, uh, of the convention. Uh, if we look at other hate conventions, we realize several hate conventions requires a central authority, either the Ministry of Justice or the court or other entities to help the um, to help to deal with the administration, the operation of the convention. But in this case, convention, we only need the court. If the uh, party brings the case to the court, then the court can um, make, uh, get it done. We do not need to involve other administrative entities. 
So it ap appears to be simple and quite straightforward. The convention only operates between contracting states that have not objected treaty relations to each other. So that means the member states, contracting states, still have the opportunity to decide the application or non-application of the convention to certain countries. If, uh, for example, so one country might not recognize a certain state. So they would not, not like to apply the convention to this state, which the government has not recognized. So that's a very brief introductions to the Hague, Conve uh, Hague Judgment Convention. But it's rather important to see that the work is not over yet. Uh, the work continues. As I mentioned, the, we have the first step to deal with the choice of court judgment in 2005. And then the second step is to uh, have uh, the 2019 judgment convention. But now work continues to the third step to deal with the jurisdiction issue, jurisdiction, because we haven't made any documents, agreements, conventions on direct jurisdiction. So now this will be the timing for negotiation on the jurisdiction. Furthermore, it's rather important to see about the operation of uh, ODR, online dispute resolution. Uh, the ODR project, online dispute resolution project, uh, mainly targets the transborder or cross-border uh, tourists. Uh, they believe that tourists is put at a disadvantaged position. So we believe that traditional dispute resolution mechanism could not function very well. We will need to look at the online dispute resolution mechanism to help the tourists to claim compensation, claim damages. So that's why the negotiation is still ongoing. So these are the some uh, ongoing projects and hopefully within the next few years, we can see some substantial development. But uh, I must say the negotiation takes time and indeed I think it uh, proves to be rather difficult. Uh, but we will have to wait and see. Um, um, I think before I conclude my presentation, I would of, of course also mention about uh, the involvement of the China and other countries during the negotiation of, of the judgment convention. It's rather interesting to see that many countries participate in the negotiation process, not only the state, but also NGOs. So I think it's very good to see the process of uh, um, consensus building process for the a judgment convention. This also lay a solid foundation for member states, to, for the countries to consider whether to join, to exit to the 2019 um, member, uh, member sorry, uh, conventions. So I think that's also something why the HCCH or the Secretary General uh, are very optimistic with the 2019 uh, convention. Uh, China has already signed the 2005 uh, choice of court convention, but not yet ratified. So hopefully this can be done. When it comes to the 2019 uh, Hague Judgment Convention, hopefully um, the government will start considering whether to, uh, when to sign the documents. But I must say the Chinese government has been actively participated in the whole negotiation process. And this is a very good sign um, uh, for the uh, signature and also a ratification of the convention. So with this, I conclu conclude my presentation and I pass the floor back to Professor Kip. Okay, Professor Jaw, thank you. A really interesting uh, uh, overview of the, uh, uh, the convention. Uh, and of course, we, as I say, in Hong Kong are going to have to get uh, used to the convention when we're looking at the uh, arrangements uh, between Hong Kong and uh, China in the near uh, future. Um, a couple of questions. The first question I want to, to ask you is about the uh, exclusion from the convention. Um, I've got a question here that makes the, the point isn't it a major um, weakness 
of the convention, a major drawback to it, that it excludes uh, everything to do with intellectual property. Um, have you any comment to make about that? Uh, uh, the project, I think, actually started in 1992. It took uh, many, many years to uh, come up with uh, some concrete results. So that shows a uh, difficulty during the negotiation. Uh, as, um, the 2019 convention, um, when compared with the 2005 convention, uh, some new issues were included, some issues were removed. Uh, so this, of course, has something to do with the views, positions of the uh, member states. Uh, if we stick to, uh, inc well, if we include all these issues, of course, we can say it's rather comprehensive, it's very good, it's, uh, the, the convention can, uh, um, can uh, uh, cover many, many issues. That's a very good uh, sign. But on the other hand, this causes difficulties for member states to join the convention. So uh, we try to uh, build up the, the consensus among the member states. The member, uh, the Professor Gibber, you have mentioned about the IP. Obviously, IP has always been considered to be one major issue uh, that should have been uh, covered in the convention as claimed by many experts during the negotiation. But there are also very strong oppositions to the inclusion of the IP in, uh, into the convention. So um, with no consensus made, so uh, the result is to temporarily exclude the IP from the convention. Uh, uh, so this is kind of, kind of balance of the efficiency and flexibility etc. So of course I think I, I would say it's a pity to see some issues are excluded but on the other hand um, it's good to see the convention already being concluded and we have something to start with and then we can continue to work further to reach further consensus. Uh, so I think that's a um, working method that the uh, HCCH is working on. Uh, some uh, experts can be quite um, uh, um, uh, unhappy with uh, the exclusion of certain items, some uh, certain issues. Some uh, can be look from the other way around. Uh, so whether we will say this is a success or it's a failure, uh, I think we should be optimistic to see the conclusion of the convention uh, and we should work further to include many other issues. Uh, but it's a good starting point, I think, to have the convention now um, and then we can slow work further. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, one thing that I, I don't think you addressed directly uh, in your, your, your talk, but to me this is um, a particularly um, uh, interesting development, is that the convention and indeed our own uh, mutual arrangement between Hong Kong and the mainland, for the first time uh, allows enforcement of non-money judgments. And I'm just wondering how that, how you think that would, you know, work in, in practice. You have some countries, for example, like Hong Kong, who very seldom uh, grant orders of specific performance. And you're going to then have the spectacle in the future of a court not used to granting that sort of order, having to interpret maybe rather obscure language from a foreign court about the nature of the order and then applying it in their own jurisdiction. And I suppose as well that the sanction for non-compliance will be you no know, contempt of court. So the idea that a citizen and country X could go to jail because they failed to obey a, an order that originally came from country Y, that's quite a, 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 a major sea change in the whole concept of enforcement of judgments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding this issue, I think were, indeed, I think it's very uh, useful and very important. Uh, the issue was also uh, touched upon during the negotiation. 
uh, indeed, uh, the enforcement of a non monetary uh, damage, et cetera, I think uh, proves to be rather difficult. So in principle, the convention itself, I think put down in principle uh, that we will, of course, respect the, uh, the regime of the requested state. So I think that's one way to look at how this will be done. We basically respect the sovereignty of the, um, the requested state. So that's the basic point, I think, to start with. Uh, we also look at some scenarios or the examples that you have brought up. Uh, so that means uh, we will not uh, um, force or uh, ask the requested state, the court, to take up the measures or actions that were not put down in the legal regime of that state. Uh, so that's the basic position. Um, this, of course, also proves to be one area that requires further uh, uh, interpretation. At the moment, we do not uh, uh, have clear ideas. Now, this is the uh, areas which have already been put down in the explanatory note report, which were released early this year. Uh, this is the issue, but what, how can we do? I think the position is just leave to the requested state. So that's uh, something I think we look at and we will still have to wait and see how this will be done when it comes to specific measures that were to, to enforce the judgment. Okay, thank you. We're almost out of time. I just want to uh, finish off by asking you uh, a slightly uh, uh, provocative uh, question, or it's a provocative comment, and it's from a partner in uh, Clifford Chance in an article they wrote about the convention. And they said, in 60 years' time, it may be possible to judge whether the convention really has changed its ga the game or whether like its 1971 predecessor it's merely an interesting footnote in international law what do you think about that quote <laughs> uh, thank you very much i think that's very interesting to see uh, uh, before the project started, the judgment of the project started, we already have the 1971 uh, convention, uh, which I very briefly mentioned is not very successful, only five members uh, to that convention. Um, the failure of the 1971 convention, I think we, talk, uh, we uh, always think about the bilateralism. You require the member states to reach a bilateral agreements uh, for, to, uh, for the operation of the convention. That one, the second uh, reason for the in, uh, direct uh, jurisdiction issue. So that's a failure there. Uh, well, I think the 2019 convention, uh, I think I've, uh, for me, I think I'm a bit more optimistic. Of course, it will take time to see, but we are um, um, a, a bit uh, optimistic regarding uh, this convention because the involvement of many members, experts, and also the entities in negotiation, they have reached consensus. There's also some flexibility um, mechanism put in the convention. So when it comes to the acceptance or uh, entry in force of the convention, uh, probably it was uh, much more successful than the 1971 convention. That was, of course, a prediction. Uh, and also, I think that's a very optimistic way to see. Uh, but well, I think just wait and see. I think hopefully I'm optim uh, quite optimistic, but <laughs> we will still have to see the reality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much again. I, I really enjoyed uh, your, your talk. and. Uh, I wish the convention well. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, uh, thank you everybody. That uh, completes today's talk. And just to alert you about uh, events coming up, uh, the first of these, uh, Human Rights Enforcement and Compliance in Heritage Protection in Asia. That will be a, a very interesting seminar on the protection of cultural uh, heritage. Um, in the Asian uh, region by Dr. Stephen uh, Gruber. And the next one, uh, all you ever want to know about arbitration, but were too uh, afraid to ask. Um, the, the abstract for that provides that it's going to be a slightly uh, irreverent, not irrelevant, a slightly irre irreverent look at international arbitration, the strengths and weaknesses of, of international arbitration from a very experienced uh, arbitrator. And then finally, the uh, impact of COVID-19 on Hong Kong's uh, 
at children. This is a empirical research. The, the effect that you know COVID nineteen has had uh, on domestic violence in Hong Kong and the the impact it's had on uh, at children and looking as well at other uh, wider issues that the impact that COVID-19 has had on things like uh, children's uh, education and social welfare issues. Okay, thank you very much indeed for uh, uh, attending uh, today and uh, I, I hope you sign up for some future sessions. Thank you very much. Uh, we are CUHK. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye-bye.